This is Walter Cronkite. Watch for You Are There in another dramatization of one of history's great events by tuning to this channel tonight. You are there tonight. July 4th, 1776, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. You are there. Walter Cronkite reporting July 4th, 1776. The notorious failure in diplomacy between Great Britain and her most powerful colonies in the Americas is today reaching a climax. The Declaration of Independence by the rebels will be submitted to a vote by what loyal Englishmen call a Congress of Traitors, all with their heads in the noose. At the moment, after a year of vacillation, the Continental Congress is about ready to proclaim a written document from which there will be no exit victory or utter submission to King George. Two days ago, at a regular session of the Continental Congress, the following resolution was unanimously adopted. Quote, that these united colonies, that is, those in rebellion against Great Britain, are and of a right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Quote, closed. The question now remains whether or not this open claim independence will not be followed by an outbreak of civil war in the colonies, where a good third of the inhabitants are still loyal citizens to the mother country. We take you to Philadelphia. All things are as they were then, except you are there. This is Ned Calmer, and we're in the State House, just outside the room where the Continental Congress has been meeting for these past two years. The delegates around the table inside are the drafting committee, which has submitted the Declaration of Independence, and a number of congressional leaders. Since yesterday, they've been meeting and recessing while changes are made in the document. Here comes Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, who wrote the document, uh, Mr. Jefferson. and following him is Mr. Benjamin Franklin, another committee member. Let them hack it as they will. I have no stomach. Well, the document must satisfy all the delegates. It will end by expressing the will of none. Well, when you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joined wisdom, you inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinions, their local interests, and their selfish views. Mr. Franklin, sir, do you believe the Congress will agree on any document? Of course, since they have no choice. And that reminds me of something that happened to a friend. He wanted to open a hat store, so he composed a sign which read, John Thompson, Hatter, makes and sells hats for ready money. He submitted it to his friends for their approval, and each one found something else in the sign superfluous, until in the end, he had nothing left except the name Thompson, and above it, the picture of a hat. Those critics in there will leave nothing but our name signed to a picture of a British gallows. I'll save what I can. Oh, Mr. Jefferson, if you please, sir. Are they making many changes in the Declaration? They are cutting it to bits. For what reason, sir? Because no man can leave well enough alone. Our committee submitted the document. It embodies all that has been thought and said during these past years. Are they making it stronger or weaker? Weaker. Will it affect the issue of independence? No. That step was taken two days ago in our unanimous resolution. We are a new nation, sir. And what remains to be seen is whether the people will defend their independence or not. It lies completely with them, but the debate is over. Well, then why the squabbling about the document? Men do not fight wars merely to fight, but out of need and principle. The document formalizes our purposes and our situation. It must express the resolution, the hopes, the necessity of three millions in this land who have not yet passed from the status of subjects of judge to free men with a nation of their own. What will the nation be called? The United States of America. But only the deity himself knows whether we are a nation united or disunited at this moment. We will be able to tell only when the document is taken into the homes of the people and not before. But Mr. Jefferson. Jefferson. All right, gentlemen. Excuse me, sir. I must now go in and calmly approve of the murder of Frankfurt, a small town, where we're going to sample public opinion on this historic day. Come in, Harry Marble. Harry Marble here in the White Main Inn in Frankfurt, Pennsylvania, five miles north of Philadelphia. Modest country tavern right on the main road. 
It catches a certain amount of the Delaware traffic and some of the trade going west to the frontier country. We've picked this town because active recruiting for the Continental Army is going on here. And this has aroused the deepest feelings pro and con on the question of war and independence. Pennsylvania, one of the proprietary colonies, belongs to the middle group that is about evenly divided between loyalists and rebels. Uh, sir, how do you stand, sir, on independence for the colonies? I haven't made up my mind. What business are you in, sir? The feed and grain. Do you think it's right for the colonies to be free of English control? Well, sir, to tell you the truth, I feel more like an American than an Englishman. Were you born in the colonies? In the Jerseys. What will you do if English and Hessian troops invade your town to enforce the king's laws? Fight, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir? Good day, friend. How do you feel about the war that seems to be breaking out over the question of independence? I dread it. Is it a question of your religion? We Quakers are opposed to war. Are you for independence? I am. Thank you. Uh, sir, I'd like your views on independence. I am opposed to it, sir. It will lose us the power we have from our connection with the English throne. What's your profession, sir? I'm an attorney, sir. I practice in Philadelphia. Uh, my feeling is that with moderation on both sides, we may reconcile with the mother country. Well, how do you reconcile the actions of Great Britain on the questions of taxation and self-government? Oh, the king has been wrongly advised. Time will cure these evils, while violence will only inflame them. I am for reconciliation. What about you, sir? I'm for the first man who buys me a drink. <laughs> what if the war comes here? I will go there. <laughs> a gentleman, I suppose you boys know what we're trying to find out. Oh, these boys are volunteers waiting for Captain Graydon. Have you signed up yet? Waiting to. What do your parents say? My father's just waiting until the fall harvest gets in and he's going to join me. And what about you, son? Go with Tom. What does your father say? Indians killed my father. And your mother? French killed her. And now you're going to fight the British? The way I feel, I don't want anybody coming in here with guns telling me what to do. And you, sir, I suppose you're from western Pennsylvania? Oh, yes, sir. From way past the fort at Pittsburgh. And I've come here with this, to join up with General Washington. Why are you for independence? Well, sir, out where I come from, where there's nothing but trees, far as you can see. Well, it seems foolish to think of ourselves as anything but free and for ourselves. And it's the wilderness that makes us independent. Neighbor! Sir? We're making a survey of opinion in this region. What opinion, sir? Your opinion of the resolution of July 2nd by the Continental Congress proclaiming the colonies independent of Great Britain. My opinion, sir, is that it's humbug. Hear, hear, hear. Well, we have an audience of patriots here, eh? English ones. Uh, my compliments to the gentlemen. Serve them what they wish. Hear, hear. Hear. Thank you, sir. I take it, sir, that you are a Tory. A loyalist, sir. Born and bred in this colony. Educated in part, at home and at Cambridge, England. And I suppose you're not impressed by the resolution of Congress. I am not. Nor should anyone by a gang of pettifogging lawyers, bankrupt shopkeepers and outlawed smugglers. I only regret, sir, that this action by an organized minority will cause civil war and disaster. You don't seem to be afraid to express your opinions in public. Sir, they may ride a poor bailiff on the rail or burn the goods of a merchant, but I assure you that this rebel in arms will not molest me. <laughs> well, lad, you hear what a gentleman says? Do you see how these Liberty Boys operate on the minds of those too young to understand? Here they are, ready to go off and be killed for independence. Where in the whole world, sir, is there more independence than that of the Englishman under the British Constitution? I agree, sir. And I would say that these lads could help their country more by helping us quiet the hotheads and aiding in reconciliation. Sir, are you for suppressing the rebellion by force? I cannot forbear to wish, sir, that this commotion would end without it, and that these rebels would be subdued by terror rather than bloodshed. 
You think, mister, you can subdue me by terror? I'm for rebellion. I was not addressing you, sir. But I was talking to you. Uh, mind your manners, you Indian, when you speak to a gentleman. Recruiting for the Continental Army to follow under General Washington and chase the Hessians and the Redcoats from our shore. Here I am with money to pay and a gun for every patriot. Now step right up to Captain Graydon and sign your name and off we'll go. How dare you, sir, recruit for a rebellion? Why, you seem like a gentleman and officer. How dare you, sir, stand in the way of the will of the free and independent American nation. I, yeah. Yeah. I will write my name down for it. Right. That's I here you are, sir. No, no, no. Good Just sign yeah. yeah. up. Make an exit. <laughs> Hurry up now. You don't have to read it. You don't have to read it. You can't read anyway. Why, you're a dirty dog of a liberty boy. Why, you... I don't think we can find out anything else at the moment. Come in, Ned Calmer, in Philadelphia. This is Ned Calmer, back in the State House anteroom in Philadelphia. The delegates are returning for the reopening of the session to consider Jefferson's statement of independence. That is Mr. Samuel Adams, a delegate from Massachusetts. Mr. Alsop from New York. He is personally against the resolution and the document on independence. The young man with him is Edward Rutledge of South Carolina. He's 26, the youngest member of Congress. He helped organize the opposition to the resolution on independence, but finally voted for it. And here is Mr. John Dickinson of Pennsylvania, the leader of the opposition to independence in the colonies. Oh, Mr. Dickinson, all of the delegates are not yet here. Only Mr. Dickinson, of all those here, did not vote for independence. Just what his role will be here today is not known. That's John Hancock, President of the Congress, who's arguing with Mr. Jefferson. It is my opinion, sir, that the whole passage on the matter of slavery must be omitted. And why, sir? Why continue what we know is wrong? We know it is an abomination. The last speaker was John Adams. Let me read it to you again and tell me if it helps or hinders independence. Gentlemen. Benjamin Franklin. We are not met here to condemn all the abominations with which human beings amuse themselves, but only those which hinder us from independence. Well, that is, sir. Uh, permit me. Uh, Mr. Richards, will you please close the doors? The document goes on about King George. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, Violence most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death on their transportation hither. And so it goes on. I do not think, gentlemen, that that paragraph will aid us in the South. I'm from the South. I own slaves, and yet I would gladly end the practice. If I may, while I have been opposed to immediate independence, Nevertheless, I voted for it to maintain unanimity, without which we cannot survive the present struggle with Great Britain. But I assure you, gentlemen, if you include this paragraph, you will exclude from our forces those who have most bitterly opposed the king. Well, Mr. Jefferson? We can take it to a vote. But let us avoid voting on all minor issues. You call slavery a minor issue? As opposed to liberty and survival of the new nation, yes. Besides, this will not only be slaveholders in the South who will oppose us, but merchants and ship owners of New England who have done more than the king to further this abominable practice. Very well, remove it. And now there is the next paragraph, attacking the English people. We have no need to antagonize them. Even while they assassinate us? But the purpose of this document is to aid us in our cause, not to hinder us. Strike it out. I advise it. I agree. Let us but agree. I would like to suggest, gentlemen... A new cause for division and diversion? Sir? Sir, we are making a revolution. We have no time for further vacillation. You, Mr. Hancock, are the president of this assembly. I urge you to postpone the vote on the declaration. There is no need for this document. We know this gentleman's opinion. You do not, for you have never listened to them. Only to your own. Two days ago, against my advice and without my vote, this Congress adopted a resolution for independence. 
Very well, now we are free. We are generally declared free. How this will aid us in the present struggle, I do not know. But I do know that if we publish this long and involved document, you will find every word and sentence will find a thousand to disagree, as we disagree here. This document will create division, not unity. It will serve each man as his reason why he is against independence. Well, sir, we are removing these phrases and clauses which would cause dissension. The document will cause dissension. Its very existence will do it. Is it my understanding that you are saying independence will be hurt by the publication of this document? By its very passage. We have declared for independence. Now let us get it by battle. Of what use are the words which can only cause disagreement and strain among ourselves while they unite our enemies? Well, what do you say, gentlemen? Shall we go over the document again and judge it again? There is much weight in Mr. Dickinson's statement. And while he has been for reconciliation, his patriotism is undeniable. Not for me. Not for me. I should like to hear from Samuel Adams on this whole affair. And like the rest of us, Sam Adams knows what's going on in the streets and on the farms, where the people who will have to fight and who are fighting live. What do you say, Sam? By the Prohibition Act, the King, Lords and Parliament have thrust these colonies from them. It makes us independent in spite of ourselves. Let us admit it. John. Sam. Mr. Dickinson, as you know, I infrequently speak in Congress. I'm not off. I know only the facts. We know that you alone, almost by yourself, have created the revolution in Boston. I wish it were true. I admit I have longed for American independence. But I agree with my cousin that it's the king and parliament who have given it to us by their actions. I cannot conceive of one good reason that can be assigned against the declaration. Will it widen the breach? That would be a strange question after we've raised armies and fought battles with British troops, and set up an American Navy. I tell you, sir, the Tories dread a declaration of independence more than death. For a declaration will create unity. The Tories will welcome it. No, sir, they will not. General Washington is against independence and has not come out for it. He knows that it is better to fight and win and then declare it. It is no longer true, sir. I have here a letter from William Palfrey, who writes that Washington has declared that when he first took command, he abhorred the idea of independence. But he's now fully convinced that nothing else can save us. But why is this? Because he must lead troops into battle. They will not die for the lesser cause. Men will only die for their ideal of human conduct. And the Tories know this. And they also know what it will mean for us among our possible allies. Precisely. And Silas Dean has written from Paris, where he's endeavoring to obtain guns and money for us, that a mere resolution of independence will be only considered a preliminary step in the proper direction. Until a decisive step is taken, he can do nothing. We need allies. We need to unify the patriots. But most of all, we need a sense that there is no turning back. A declaration will assure this to the full. Hear, yeah, hear. Yeah. Stancock, now let's call this Congress into session and get on with the work of liberty and war. Gentlemen, take your places. The recess is terminated. You may get on with the work without me. We will read the amended declaration and vote upon it. Gentlemen, take your places. I will wait for dinner. <coughs> Mr. Dickinson? Yes? Is there any further statement you wish to make? Yes, sir. I resent this patriotism. I was among the very first men on this continent who, by open and decided steps, staked his life and fortune, my country's cause. But it was my own life. I do not as freely offer the lives and fortunes of others. I do not see the need of informing the enemy of our ultimate aim. Foreign aid will be gained only by victories in the field. We ought to know what aid will be forthcoming before we take the step. We should fight from local governments acceptable by the people. We should first form a national government 
on which we can all agree. And I can only say, sir, that I disagree, and I go now to join my regiment and fight the enemy. Let the rest of them talk as they will. If they are right, history will sustain them. If they are wrong, history will blame all of us. In any event, sir, my lot is with the Patriots, right or wrong. It's being carried! It's being carried! What is the vote of Rhode Island? Rhode Island votes aye. South Carolina? Aye. What is the vote of Virginia on this Declaration of Independence as read to us this day? Virginia votes aye. The vote is unanimously carried. I move, sir. I move. I move, sir, that the Declaration be authenticated and printed. That a committee be appointed to superintend and correct the press. The copies of the Declaration be sent to the several assemblies, conventions, and committees or councils of public safety, and to the several commanding officers of the Continental Troops. That it be proclaimed in each of the United States and at the head of the army. Second! Second. 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 The motion is unanimous, Harry. We must be unanimous. There must be no pulling different ways. We must all hang together. Yes, indeed, we must hang together, or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. <laughs> Gentlemen, let us review the words of this declaration. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So the great Declaration of Independence came into existence, and with it, this nation. That night it went to press, and while the great seal of the new nation was designed, the document went around the country and into the world, lighting the fire of liberty ever higher. John Adams always thought that July 2nd was a more important date than July 4th, and 40 years later, no one could remember when it was that everyone signed. The historians are still arguing these points, but for the people of the world, for Americans, it's the letter and spirit of the magnificent principles that count, the profound basic thought that each one of us is entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that governments exist for their peoples and not peoples for governments. What sort of a day was it? A day like all days, filled with those events that alter and illuminate our times. And you were there.